This programming is sponsored by Central Market, offering more than 70 types of scratch-made breads, buttermilk-based muffins, cookies, cupcakes, patisserie, custom cakes, and more. All baked fresh daily. More at centralmarket.com. This is Houston Matters. I'm Craig Cohen. Good morning. Coming up this hour, Texas Democrats have sought to turn Texas blue for decades now. We explore why when it comes to statewide offices, it just hasn't happened. Also, this week's the good, the bad, and the ugly. But first, it's been just over 30 days since John Whitmire took his oath as Houston's 63rd mayor. His first month in office has seen some changes in senior leadership, most recently for the Houston airport system. Elon Chang covers local politics and city hall for the Houston Chronicle. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, a longtime Houston airport system director, Mario Diaz, has left. Uh, Jim Sesniak has replaced him. This is one of a number of changes in yes. top level officials. Who are some of the others? Right. So the mayor has really just been getting rid of people left and right the past few weeks, right? Uh, so far, he has appointed a new director for uh, the neighborhoods department, the planning department, the finance department, and like you said, the Houston airport system. Um, and we are expecting more changes in the coming weeks, too. And also, he recently told us at an interview, he hinted that, you know, right now we have 22 departments at a city and that might be too many departments. So we could be looking at some potential restructuring of certain city operations as well. And this is, I mean, it's a mayor's prerogative, right? It's yes. not unusual, I imagine, for a new administration to make personnel changes like it's this. It's not. It's not. I would say the speed he's moving right now is somehow somewhat on par with what Mayor Turner did when he first became mayor. Um, I will say, though, that Whitmire seems to be taking his time uh, in some other areas. Like, we haven't seen any city council committee assignments yet. And then the city hall, the weekly city council meeting agendas have been pretty light in the past months. Uh, and there really haven't been too many major announcements coming out of his office yet. Uh, so we are, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see what he does in the coming months. Has, has he given any indication as to why that is the case? Is it just he's kind of focusing on personnel first? Well, you know, um, we're having a new mayor for the first time in eight years, which is obviously a huge transition for the city, but it's also been a huge transition for John Whitmire. You know, managing like the fourth largest city in the country is a very different job than being a state senator. So it's a lot less political, but a lot more work. Uh, we're talking about, you know, he's promised to improve public safety, uh, to resolve the firefighters dispute, to expand city services and all of that. And obviously they're all tough challenges challenges to tackle. And it's going to take a little longer than one month to really act on most of those promises. Yeah, I guess uh, managing a legislative staff for, well, 50 years, it's a little bit different and a little bit smaller scale in terms of number of people and number of different kinds of priorities, right. I suspect. And just like managing a huge bureaucracy. Yeah. Uh, among the changes was the resignation late last month of Houston Public Works Head of Transportation and Drainage, Veronica Davis. You've reported that observers both inside and outside City Hall were specifically sorry to see her go. Why? Um, so both Veronica and another, actually another major departure, um, the our transportation planner, our chief transportation transportation planner who left shortly after Veronica have caused some people to express you know, concerns about where the city is going when it comes to transportation policy. Um, both of these like two senior officials were very well respected at the city and also have been praised by local activists for trying to improve street designs and make them safer for pedestrians and cyclists. And at the same time, we're seeing how the mayor is slowing down or reversing uh, a number of street redesign pro uh, projects. So I think it's safe to say that you know, the direction that he's taking with transportation policy is one of the major point of contention at City Hall right now. Yeah, one great example of that is Houston Avenue. Uh, there had been a, a project uh, underway just a couple of months ago. They put exactly. in these, these curbs and, and then there were concerns raised, as I recall, from residents. Uh, also, the suggestion made that... Uh, uh, emergency services, bus drivers, others would have suddenly a harder time getting into certain uh, uh, neighborhoods uh, and uh, you know making 
the, there are turns they couldn't make anymore, and so now they're going to kind of do this about face on, on that particular project. Right, right. I mean, Whitmire, even during his mayoral campaign, made it clear that Houston is still a car-centric city, and he's not a big fan of things like you know, bike lanes or, you know, similar projects. Uh, and of course, a lot of local residents feel the same way. And a lot of them do not. They feel really passionate, passionately about how we should uh, really redesign Houston in a way that is more future oriented and have more in mind walkability and safety for pedestrians and cyclists. So that's something I think is going to continue to play out at City Hall in the coming months. So that's obviously one uh, potential change in priorities and focus uh, right. with this new administration. Are there others? Yes. Um, Whitmire has repeatedly criticized the city's top-level leadership uh, under Turner, uh, especially the permitting center, uh, the housing department, water operations at Public Works. So those are some areas that we should watch for when it comes to new policies and new leadership. And I would say that some of the criticism appear to be uh, valid, at least to a certain extent. You know, we just learned um, the current housing director allegedly violated city, city regulations by selling city laptops and iPads to employees at a cheap price instead of going through the proper channel to dispose of them. Um, and, you know, so it's going to be interesting to see, like, we haven't seen any major leadership changes at the housing department yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if the mayor appoints a new director today. Are there any other, I, I'm thinking about as we look ahead the coming months, maybe the next couple of years, there are going to be certain, it tends to be that there are certain things that bubble to the top as the, the major priorities for any administration. Do we know for sure what that will be at this point? Okay, well, currently one of the more pressing issues is resolving the firefighters dispute that the city has been, you know, having with the union for the past seven years. The firefighters have not had a contract for seven years, and Whitmire was endorsed by the union during the campaign, and um, he has promised to resolve the whole dispute by the end of this month, which I think is pretty ambitious. But then also you had to figure out a way to pay for it. People are you know, estimating that this could cost the city over $500 million. And we just don't have that kind of money to spend on the deal right now. So the mayor will have to find out a way to really finance his deal with the firefighters. And that could be a major point of tension throughout his administration. Like, how is he going to hire more police, you know, pay the firefighters and expand city services all at the same time? Like, where's the money going to come from? Well, it won't be coming from the federal government uh, <laughs> because those those dollars are going to be exhausted this exactly. budget year in 2025. Could get really interesting. Mm -hmm. Elin Cheng is reporter for the Houston Chronicle who covers local politics and city hall. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Up next, another election cycle, another attempt by Texas Democrats to turn Texas blue. But Republicans have controlled statewide offices for decades now. What does history and current trends tell us about whether that's likely to change anytime soon? We discuss as Houston Matters continues. This is Houston Matters. I'm Craig Cohen. And here we go again. Another election cycle. Another political action committee is trying to turn Texas blue. It's been 34 years now since a Democrat won a statewide race in Texas. That was the late Governor Ann Richards, by the way. And yet, every election year, and let's face it, when isn't it an election year, somebody comes along with the goal of shifting Texas from Republican to Democratic rule. This time, it's the Texas Majority PAC backed by billionaire George Soros. But it's hardly the only one out there, and it's hardly the first time anyone's tried to flip the script, as it were, in the Lone Star State. Is anything different in 2024? We will contemplate that in a bit. We'll start, though, with a little bit of Texas political history, courtesy of Raul Ramos, an associate professor of history at the University of Houston, who speaks with Houston Matters producer Garrett Bowman. Republicans began to dominate statewide politics after the election of George W. Bush for governor and, and his defeat of Ann Richards, who at that time was an incredibly popular governor. 
though to just focus on the beginning of that dominance ignores how dominant Democrats were statewide for at least 80 years before that. And the first cracks in that dominance, which I think was the election of John Tower to the U.S. Senate in 1961, I think that was would have appeared as something of a shock at that time. But I think it makes sense in a broader context when we see changes that were taking place across the state of Texas at that time, but really across the national landscape as well. Along with Tower winning, I, I think it's important to note that Lyndon Johnson, the senator from Texas, who became vice president and later president, was also not just a leader of the National Democratic Party, but signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which I think marks a watershed moment in how the Democratic Party defined itself nationally and what appears to be an abandonment of the Democratic Party for the Republican Party, at least within Texas, which begins as a slow drip around the election of Tower and later the election of Clements for governor. But then you start to see as more and more common. You And so you end up having this roughly 20, 25 year period where there's maybe we'd call it power sharing between Democrats and Republicans. And so the last straw essentially uh, takes place with the election of George W. Bush. And I mention it not in the sense that he is able to get that statewide support, but rather Ann Richards was very popular at that time. She had over 60 percent approval ratings and still lost. And I think what we can turn to there is not just the consolidation of the Republican vote, but the growth of the Republican vote by incorporating evangelicals who were, I think, before that, just not party affiliated, just non-voting. They end up becoming a, a constituency within that that new Republican Party. And I think the person we can look to that is uh, Karl Rove as a, as a strategist who saw that as an untapped resource. You mentioned the late Governor Ann Richards. It's been 34 years now since a Democrat won a statewide race in Texas. What did Ann Richards do that allowed her to win that has eluded Democrats ever since? I don't think Ann Richards did anything in particular to win in the sense that she, what she did was she was a Democrat. I mean, this was still the time that the Democratic Party uh, was in control uh, of the state. And so she had come up through the Democratic Party establishment, as it were. I think what's shocking about her situation, again, is not that she won the governorship. It's how she lost it and was not reelected, uh, even though she was so popular at that time. And really, that came from both expanding the electorate, but also the erosion of Democratic support uh, over the 20, 25 years before that, that really starts to accelerate after uh, Johnson signs the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Have there been other periods in Texas history of this degree and length of single party dominance? Well, it feels like Republican dominance has been here forever, and certainly there's entire generations that have been born and now voting that have never known any other kind of party winning statewide elections. You had an even longer period of Democratic reign, and one that is directly connected with the reaction to and the response to the Civil War and to Reconstruction. The Democratic Party really saw itself as the redeemer for the South, and certainly within Texas that, that view was dominant. They were the bulwark against Northern intervention, Northern aggression, initially, I guess, aggression in the Civil War. But but even that idea of self-rule dominated politics in that time. And, um, and the Democratic Party saw itself as the keepers of Southern and of Texas uh, politics and identity. And, th- and that's the way it played out at that period. So we do have, starting in the 1870s, if we go all the way to Tower's election in 1961, I think we do have easily an 80, 90 year period of Democratic reign. Now, the Democratic Party itself changed a great deal during that time. You saw, uh, for instance, moments when the Democratic Party saw populism rising in uh, Texas around the, around the turn of the 20th century. You saw the Democratic Party become uh, essentially locally connected. And it was not just a question of broad political support, but really patronage that the Democratic Party supported. So if we're looking at parties during most of the 20th century, we're seeing these parties not just as a kind of identity that a voter has, but rather as a machine, if you will, that uh, runs government at every level that is in charge of distributing resources. And so having a connection with the party at, at that point is important for anybody who wants to do business. This is Houston Matters. I'm speaking with Raul Ramos, Associate Professor of History at the University of Houston. What lessons could Texas Democrats and Republicans take away from past periods in state history when one party had such firm control in state politics? 
I think if Republicans look at history, they'll see that you know they really will take an intense look at what happened. Why, how did Democrats fall from grace and fall from grace so completely? Certainly the Republicans had something to do with it. And in the case of using the National Democratic Party and tying local Democrats to the National Party became a, a way of splitting off Democratic support, but also by expanding the, the Republican brand, if you will, into these populations that previously didn't see themselves as, as politically engaged, such as evangelical groups. Likewise, for Democrats, I think they can see both opportunity by seeing that the tide does turn, that the tables can be turned. But I think there's a note of caution here, both in terms of what happened for Democrats, but also why maybe those lessons might not be as applicable today, or I I wonder if they're as applicable today. And that is for Democrats, the big rift started to develop uh, when a lot of local state Democrats, Texas Democrats, saw the National Party as essentially becoming too liberal, moving too much to the left. And that became the wedge, essentially, that Republicans were able to exploit to eventually change, to have politicians who change their party affiliation, to have voters to change their party affiliation. That that wedge between the state party and the national party became greater and greater, particularly after the 1960s. But that doesn't explain everything. And certainly, if we look at what's going on today, that national state split maybe isn't as determinative as, as it once was. In fact, I at one point would have thought that the the Republican Party and the governor's attention to national issues. I think the border is one that has been nationalized when we see governors from across the country coming to the border from, you know, congressmen coming to the border. Really, it's the the governor is playing to a national audience. And you could imagine in that Johnson way that these national Republican issues might not resonate locally. And in fact, they've had the opposite effect. And so maybe one of the things we're seeing is the rise of national party identity as becoming a much more important important than local identity. And certainly that the politics play out that way. But that's not 100 percent of the story either, because we see in the governor's defeat around the private school voucher issue, that was a national issue, a local issue, but one that drove a wedge between primarily rural Republicans and and more suburban and urban Republicans. And I think it's those kinds of wedge issues that the Democratic Party has some opportunity to exploit. But really what we're seeing is less a party that's statewide and national but one where issues start to boil down to rural issues versus urban issues and so forth. The the final issue is that, again, the the Democratic Party is strong, particularly in urban areas in Texas, but it's not a statewide party. A candidate who is popular in one particular city uh, and or metropolitan area in Texas might be totally unknown in another. And so in some ways, the national identity as a Republican has given Texas Republicans that kind of united identity Whereas in Texas for Democrats, it's still pretty regionally fragmented. Historically speaking, have Texas voters always leaned more to the right? Was there a time when that wasn't the case? Some might be surprised to know that Texas, particularly uh, from the 1880s to, say, the 1920s, was a hotbed of populism and of communitarian action through the rise of farmers cooperatives and other kinds of communitarian actions. Texas was really a place that was unfriendly to, say, big banking and corporate interests. It was well known in Texas that if a lawsuit was brought to a corporation, if you went to a jury trial, the corporation would automatically lose. I'm not sure I would put that in terms of liberal or conservative, but certainly economically speaking, it doesn't align with the way we think of uh, free enterprise and corporate uh, dominance today. So Texas, I think, has these traditions. It has traditions around sticking up for the little guy, looking out for equal opportunity. But it's also a place that, again, has its roots in the Confederacy and in the South and a reaction to the defeat of the Confederacy and the fallout from that defeat and during the Reconstruction, uh, those echoes continue to reverberate in many ways. So that's not absent. Maybe we don't always see it in those terms and we see it in that way, but certainly that's some of the parallels you might have with the rest of the South. Texas also has a libertarian streak. In fact, another way that Texas Republicans distinguish themselves, say, from Republicans in other parts of the South is their connection to libertarian movements in Arizona and Colorado and and in the West. And so in Texas, you see a unique combination of, I wouldn't necessarily call it liberal or conservative, but but libertarian as well, and all of those coming together. So it's it's a place that uh, the Republican Party has been able to at least unite the libertarian and the conservative, but that's not a guarantee that that'll always be the case. 
That's Raul Ramos, Associate Professor of History at the University of Houston. He spoke with Houston Matters Garrett Bowman, and we'll hear more from Ramos on this week's The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly a little later in the program. Joining us now is Party Politics co-host Brandon Roddinghouse, Professor of Political Science at UH. Brandon, good morning. Good morning, Craig. Republicans have held every statewide office in Texas for decades. They control both houses of the Texas legislature, uh, though the Texas Senate's efforts have been clearly more conservative than the Texas House, where the GOP has this slim majority. Our U.S. senators are and have been Republicans for years and years. Has there been any moment in recent years when it has seemed as though the pendulum has begun to swing the other way in Democrats' favor in state politics, or is Texas just as red as ever? Yeah, Texas used to be uh, rich with Democratic history. Professor Ramos mentioned this. The fact that since the Civil War had basically been a one-party state uh, certainly suggests that there's just this uh, kind of ethos in Texas, and now it's Republicans in charge. Um, it's been a long time since Democrats have been able to make some in road since the 1994 where you had a handful of Rep democratic elected officials this is the last time that like friends first time friends was on the air <laughs> and <laughs> Frazier was on for the very first time now it's been rebooted there have been some moments in elections where there's been opportunities for democrats to be able to make some inroads and as we've seen from history when there's been a kind of crack in that armor. It's been in an odd way, in an unexpected way. So the 2018 election was one of those elections where you did see a very close race between Beth O'Rourke running for U.S. Senate and Ted Cruz, who was running for re-election. The amount of support that O'Rourke got from suburban voters, from leaning independents, from some Republicans, and a swell of Democrats was one of those times where they were really enthusiastic about that possibility. Was that just one figure, one personality that kind of broke through and got close? And does that suggest to you that maybe there's there's no blue wave coming? It's hard to say. Um, this is something that's dependent on some national trends and also depending, yes, I think you're right, on personalities. In that case, you had two personalities. One was that people really liked Bethel O'Rourke. He was a kind of fresh face. He had presented as a kind of bipartisan entity that could be a bridge builder but also support the Democratic line. And Ted Cruz, of course, was not liked, <laughs> not just from Democrats but also Republicans. And it was a national thing. And that's really what spiked the amount of money Money that it costs to run that race. And so that's really, I think, the difference maker in most elections. If national money doesn't come to Texas and you can't kind of home grow this organic support among the Democratic base that exists out there in theory, but that never materializes in practice, then it's going to be really hard for Democrats to win. Democrats have dominated some local politics in recent years mm -hmm. in cities like Houston, uh, also seizing control in recent years in some counties like Harris County. Does that ever eventually translate to political uh, ground gained in state politics or not? It's a really good question. Um, it does eventually, I think, move in that direction. And Texas is a big and booming state. And you're certainly seeing a significant trend towards the blue urban areas becoming more prominent in elections. And so if you look at the difference between the 2016 election and the 2020 election, you saw an increase in the turnout among Democrats in places like Dallas and Houston by between 2% and 7%. This is a major jump because that's where a lot of people live. And as a result, Democrats are hopeful they can take advantage of that. But there are some counter facts that are make it hard for Democrats to be able to do this well. First is that virtually half of the entire electorate doesn't vote. They're eligible to vote, but they don't vote. So for instance, in 2022, about nine and a half million people were eligible to vote in Texas, but didn't vote. So this is a huge chunk of people whom Democrats want to motivate, but whom they've been challenged to do so. The other fact is that the Republican Party, has, the Democratic Party has a larger deficit with Anglo voters than Republicans have with Hispanic voters. Uh, and while younger voters are becoming more of a prominent feature in Texas because the state's very young, the fact is that they don't vote in big numbers. And um, so that's become an issue for mobilization. That difference has become more prominent as rural Texans have turned out in bigger percentages than the urban voters. So that balance is just something Democrats have been unable to fix. That also counters this mantra that we heard over the last decade that demographics are destiny. 
Yeah. I guess they're not. They they are to some degree, but obviously it's the case that Texas isn't changing as fast and in ways that the Democrats have expected it to. So, for instance, if you think about this in just pure practical terms, in 2022, the turnout in rural Texas counties was higher than in the urban and suburban counties. And we tend to think of Texas now as a much more urban and sort of suburban place since the 1950s. This has been true. But the vote share doesn't always line up that way. So in the 20 or the 220 smallest counties in the state, the turnout was 47%. And you compare that to about 44% in the bigger counties. So obviously the numbers don't match up because the people in rural areas aren't as many as in urban areas, but the turnout percentage is much higher. And those voters vote Republican. That's been just a challenge for Democrats to be able to find other voters who can offset that in big urban areas. What then needs to happen in Texas for Democrats to, in fact, someday turn Texas blue? That's the million dollar question. Um, a couple of things might work. Um, number one, focusing on issues that are kind of those that Democrats like, but also that leaning Republicans like is important. So health care is a winner. Uh, abortion is a winner. They lose, though, when the issue is about border control or about the economy. So Democrats have to try to set the stage for what the race is going to be about. They need more women to run. They need more Latinos to run. That's a big factor in terms of promoting turnout among those groups, which is really the coalition that they need. Finally, they need young people to show up and, frankly, to run. So just generally participating is key because if they don't participate, then the energy isn't there. And we've seen a lot of examples locally and across the state in local areas where young people participating means the difference. So that's a huge factor because it's such a young state. Brandon Roddinghouse co-hosts Party Politics, which you can hear tonight at 7.30 here on News 88.7 and watch tonight at 8 on TV8 or subscribe to the Party Politics podcast wherever you get those. He is also a professor of political science at the University of Houston. Brandon, thank you very much. Thanks, Greg. A lot can happen in a week. Some of it good, some of it bad, some of it downright ugly. When faced with intriguing developments in the week's news, we turn to a rotating panel of non-experts to parse the good, the bad, and the ugly of it all. On today's panel, Vivian Ho, health economist at Rice University and Baylor College of Medicine, Charles Kuffner, who writes the -the off-the-cuff political blog, and look who's back, Raul Ramos, associate professor of history at the University of Houston. Vivian, Charles, Raul, welcome to Houston Matters. Hi, Craig. Thanks, Craig. Panel, the U.S. House impeachment vote against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas fell just short of passage Tuesday night. That's in part because a few House Republicans joined with the Democrats to defeat it. It's also because, as we noted on Wednesday's show, among the nays was a surprise vote by Houston area Democratic Congressman Al Green, who's been in the hospital since emergency surgery last Friday. The congressman came to the House floor in a wheelchair and wearing a hospital gown to cast his vote because, quote, a good man's reputation was being besmirched. The House GOP pursued the impeachment vote because they don't like how Secretary Mayorkas and President Biden have handled border security. As the Houston Chronicle's Ben Worman noted Wednesday, another Congressman Green, Republican Marjorie Taylor Green, accused Democrats of hiding their hospitalized colleague until the last minute to throw off the GOP. Houston area Congressman Al Green leaves the hospital to cast his vote, which defeats an attempted impeachment of the Homeland Security Secretary. Is this good, bad, or ugly? Charles Kuffner, start us off. I mean, it's good, and it's also hilarious. Um, The good being, I think, Representative Green's actions were both principled and courageous, and obviously probably went against best medical advice. Um, You know, one does not normally... Uh, leave the hospital in a gown like that. I mean, you know, the whole thing is a sham. It's a political maneuver. The Republicans were doing what they do because, you know, they had just embarrassingly refused to vote for the uh, immigration border compromise that they had so- themselves had demanded because they were on orders from Donald Trump to leave things in chaos so that he could make a political issue out of it. It's good that this 
follow-up attempt at more political madness was thwarted, and it's embarrassing for them. You know, it's like rule number one in legislative politics is know how many votes you have and whether or not you've got enough, and they failed that, which, I mean, <laughs> which is part of the hilarity. The other part, of course, being Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, reliably finding a galaxy-brained way of um, blaming it on anyone but themselves. It's always a conspiracy, the Democrats unfairly did not give them a heads up that their uh, guy who was on the injured list was coming in to pitch at the last minute. And, you know, it's like, uh, how, how can we compete under these circumstances? It's so unfair. King's X and all that. So, yes, it, it's good and it's hilarious. And uh, I can't wait to see what they do next. All right. Good, bad or ugly. Vivian Ho. Yeah, I agree with Charles. Good for Congressman Green that he actually had the chutzpah to sort of get his act together and show up to vote on an issue which he clearly cared about. I don't see how impeaching Mr. Mayorkas would have helped anything other than giving the folks on Fox something else to yak about. The border is in crisis. It's it's a disaster, and this isn't how to fix it. And it's so disappointing because the Senate negotiated a proposal that would have helped. It wasn't perfect, but it might have made things better. And instead, we're complaining about Representative Green showing up to vote on something he cares deeply about. I don't know where we're headed. Okay, good, bad, or ugly. Raul Ramos. Well, I, I think I share the belief that it was good. I don't know if I'd call it ugly. I'm curious what it looked like when he shows up in a hospital gown and a wheelchair. And um, it could be a little embarrassing, I suppose. I I don't like walking around in a hospital gown for sure. And and it seems like uh, you get it get kind of drafty, if you will, on the <laughs> uh, on the house floor. But uh, there's a reason the C-SPAN cameras are kind of locked in place now. You can There's enough places where you, you can uh, do things without getting noticed. So what you're saying is that C-SPAN well. was in on the conspiracy to hide Representative Green no, from, from, uh, from Marjorie Taylor Green. I think, I think uh, technically when, when there's not a speaker, C-SPAN has free reign. And as soon as a speaker is elected, they are uh, under the speaker's rules. That being said, I'm also curious about this question of how he left the hospital. Uh, typically, if you are in treatment, uh, you have uh, you're either released discharged as it were or you leave against what's called against medical opinion uh, advice ama from all appearances it either uh, he left ama or he was discharged uh, in the proper channels, in which case makes me wonder if his attending physician uh, was a Democrat who saw an opportunity right. here. This so, one goes all the way to the top. That's right. So I think if, if we're looking for conspiracies, I, I'd start with whoever the resident was on on service that day. My understanding is that he's back in the hospital. So I, I, I dare say the AMA was the was the situation. Yeah, well, I, I wish him a speedy recovery and I wish our nation a speedy recovery. Yeah, you, you would have... You would have thought someone would have stopped him, you know, during the vote and said, are you okay? Glad to see that you're still doing all right. But I don't, I don't know. I'd like to think that the doctor would not have sort of made the decision on telling him where to go based on his political affiliation, that it wouldn't have mattered. Yeah, I, 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 I know of Representative Green well enough to say he was going to do what he was going to do and, and a doctor wouldn't have stopped him. Yeah, that's, that's true as well. Panel Houston Astros star Jose Altuve this week agreed to a five-year, $125 million contract extension to keep him in an Astros uniform through age 39. Astros general manager Dana Brown says the eight-time All-Star and two-time World Series champion is an Astro for life. Altuve says Houston and his native Venezuela are his two homes and that he and his family, quote, will never move from here. Leading off for your Houston Astros, it appears at least through 2029, second baseman Jose Altuve. Is this good, bad, or ugly? Vivian. Well, it sounds good to me. I, I'm, not, I'm not a baseball fan. You know, I'm guessing Charles, Charles is going to have a lot more to say on this. But he sounds like such a great guy. He's a terrific player, got great stats, and he's humble, and people like him. Clearly, the fans like him. So... $125 million, that's money well spent. And and that he, it sounds as though he might have been able to get more if he'd sort of went out on the market, but he said he likes Houston and he wants to get 3,000 hits with the same team. So you can't get any better than that. And in terms of, I think it's money better spent than the Aggies blowing, what, $75 million on that renewal contract for Jimbo Fisher? So <laughs> there. <laughs> 
All right, good, bad, or ugly. Roll. I would say good with an asterisk. Uh, bum. Thank you. Ba-dum-ba-dum. The question here is, um, did uh, the Astros get a, at least a good value? I'm not sure a lot of teams would be very popular with their fan base if they um, signed El, uh, Jose Altuve. He's still has the stain of the cheating scandal. And I think that cer- certainly every year he puts up numbers. Uh, you know, the big picture here is the Hall of Fame and w- w- how he's going to be considered. He's already won his championships. He's already uh, Mr. Astro, Mr. Houston. I think, you know, now we're looking at legacy and this is a legacy move. I think these questions do matter. To get all those hits with one team does uh, at least influence that some, uh, I would hope. I mean, again, it hasn't succeeded ever. Look, I'm from San Antonio. I, I know about uh, Tim Duncan and David Robinson, guys who play their whole career with one team and how, how you become identified with a particular place. But speaking of place, I think there's also another story here, which again, he's from Venezuela. And uh, I think as time goes on, we're going to see one of the big changes that has been taking place in Houston that we haven't been seeing is the migration from Venezuela that's been coming and and uh, I think in numbers that we can't appreciate just yet and I don't I think there is a way that he's going to become uh, symbolic of the city as uh, going forward in in identifying with that Venezuelan community I don't know maybe we'll start talking about Houston as Nuevo Caracas you know that <laughs> there is a way that his presence here I think might bring visibility to to that community All right, Charles? I mean, of course, it's a good thing. And I I agree with uh, Raul that this is about legacy. Um, Michael Bauman on Fangraphs pointed out that Altuve is really being paid for his his past years when he was quite inexpensive to the Astros. I mean, his MVP year in uh, 2017, sorry, 2018, he really wasn't making very much money with them. So while it is extremely uncommon to give a five-year contract to someone who's already at this age, yeah, he's being paid to some extent for what he's already done, and, you know, he's more than earned it. So it's a good thing. As a New Yorker who roots for the Yankees, I absolutely appreciate uh, and respect the idea of keeping your guys in your team's colors for as long as you can. There is something special about a guy who came in and goes out and stays in between with your team. It, it really hits differently, and the, the fans appreciate it. it. It's good for, you know, your team's history, for your team's, you know, for all the intangibles, the aura, the mystique, whatever you want, you know, the story, whatever you want to call it. And they, they did right by him, and that's a good thing. And I think it all, that also helps— uh, the team in the future, right? They, it's a team that people want to come play for because they know they'll get taken care of, and yeah. so it, that I think that is uh, an an investment in the future, uh, not just uh, paying for for yeah, past performance. Uh, agree. I mean, uh, baseball team is among many other things uh, a workplace, and you want to make it a good organization. Wants to make it clear to the a talent that it wants to attract that this is a good place to work, and you'll be taken care of. Another piece I'm curious about, in hearing all of your observations on this, it's not like having five more years of Jose Altuve at second base is a bad thing. I realize that $25 million is a lot of money, but it's not my money. And uh, doesn't he make the Astros a lot better being in the well, lineup every night? Sure, right now he does, but maybe he won't at age 38, 39. I mean, Craig Biggio in the last couple of years of his career was was not... He was playing it out to get to the 3,000 hits. He, he was not really a positive contributor. Derek Jeter in his last year was not a positive contributor. I mean, he may be good up until the end. That is certainly possible. But, you know, the odds are greater than not that towards the end he'll be a, re, you know, a replacement-level player and the Astros will have to figure out how to accommodate what he wants without, you know, without reducing the team's chances of winning. But that's, that's a future problem. He's likely to be good for the next couple of years, and after that, you'll deal with it. Yeah, and my, my understanding is, like, he could go beyond age 39, a little bit that, That's also that, possible. So. I mean, it, that's the best-case scenario, obviously. Yeah. But, yeah, no, I mean, based on everything we know about baseball and the aging curve and everything else, the odds are pretty good that by the end of that contract, he will not be anywhere close to worth that money. But, again, he's being paid for the past— He's being paid to keep him as an Astro. And if in 2027 or 2028, he's not really an everyday player anymore, they'll they'll figure out a way to cope with it. I'm going to note this down in my calendar in 2029 to look at how he did. Yeah. 
Uh, well, and I will too. Don't worry. We'll hear a lot about it as it's happening. Uh, this is something that uh, baseball players stress a lot about. So uh, hopefully it's a graceful uh, decline and not a uh, one of those um, horrible declines. Yeah, I, and look, there, there are certainly plenty of examples out there of players who kind of fall off a cliff in terms of production. But there are also some who have great success at the end. Uh, just a couple of years ago, Albert Pujols had one of those fantastic final halves of a season that no one saw coming. Right, and that was after multiple years of not being very good. <laughs> but he wasn't playing for the Cardinals then, so right. I was fine with it. <laughs> well, and also... And, and remember, Altuve wasn't. This wasn't expected of him from the beginning. I mean, he's right. he's worked for everything he has, and I have a feeling, given his character and personality, and just uh, what he brings, he will fight for every hit down to the last, you know, strikeout. I think he's got the kind of profile of someone who's more likely to decline gracefully and gradually rather than fall off a cliff. He's not. He's not a big, slow-footed slugger. He's got multi, you know, he, he can do multiple things well. And as long as he is able to keep at a reasonably high level one or two of the things that he does, you know, he, making contact, having good speed, he'll be fine. I think we've reached a, a graceful and gradual decline in the conversation. So let's wrap up here. Vivian Ho is a health economist at Rice University and Baylor College of Medicine. Raul Ramos is an associate professor of history at the University of Houston. Charles Kuffner writes the Off the Cuff political blog. Vivian, Raul, Charles, thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. Greg. Thanks. Happy New Year. Houston's catastrophic theater is a longtime champion of the acclaimed Chicago-based playwright Mikkel Maher. In fact, Catastrophic has produced virtually all of Maher's work since 2008, including two world premieres. The company's latest journey into Maherland is called It Is Magic, and it opens tonight. Joining us to talk about it is the show's director, Jeff Miller, and actor Tamari Cooper. Jeff Tamari, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. All right. Well, let's first start with what should we know about Mikkel Maher's plays? Uh, that he's, I believe he's our most produced playwright in all time catastrophic history. I think we've done eight productions of Mickles. I think so. If you don't count some of our original musicals, but outside yeah, yeah. of outside of catastrophic core artists, he is definitely our most produced. And we sort of developed this love affair with him. Um, one of his scripts fell into the lap of our um, other co-artistic director, Jason Nodler, and we ended up doing The Stranger was the very first one we did in mm -hmm. 2008 and uh, followed up quickly with another one called Spirits to Enforce. That's when Mikkel came down. We had him come meet us, and we were all so nervous because we were all, like, totally nerding out on this guy's writing. Yeah. And I remember we we did the play and then took him straight to a bar, and we all had far too much to drink. <laughs> um, but I guess that was part of the bonding experience, and he recognized a kindred sort of spirit in our group of artists. And It, that, it kind know. of matches the, 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 the kinds of things he writes seem to match the kinds of productions you want to do. Yes, Yes, they are not necessarily going to be any way a message play or even necessarily plot driven, um, but there is almost always a great deal of humor in them. I think sometimes our name, Catastrophic Theater, um, maybe makes people think that we only do dark, disturbing drama, and that's not the case at all. This theater production is about a theater production. Well, two, actually. It depicts auditions for a production of The Three Little Pigs, taking place while a production of Shakespeare's Macbeth is underway in the same theater. Complications, I assume a little bit of hilarity, <laughs> ensues. Yes. Uh, I assume some of those complications have to do with the latter production and its long history and lore. Uh, can you remind us why in the theater world folks refer to Macbeth as the Scottish play? Well, because we're not supposed to say it as we're uh, in the theater or on stage because of superstitions, that bad things tend to happen when actors mention the word, so we've started using the Scottish play as to avoid using the word itself. I, I years ago at a theater in Pennsylvania did a, a fundraising event where I was interviewing uh, two of the cast members of production of Macbeth playing Lord and Lady Macbeth. And one of the running gags was that I kept referring to them as Lord and Lady the Scottish play. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So what ultimately is this play, It Is Magic, trying to say about, well, I guess community theater specifically? Well, um, 
It, it definitely is set in a community theater, um, though I do not think in any way this play is a dig at community theater. Mm -hmm. um, the definition of community theater is pretty murky, really. Um, yeah. I know when I'm uh, getting producing rights for different plays for our company. Um, sometimes we're defined as a professional theater and sometimes we're not, depending on if you have a certain amount of equity actors or some people will say, if you pay anyone anything, then you're a professional theater. Right. I think what we do have in common and what anyone can identify with, with community theater, is that there's going to be a lot of passion and a lot of work with not enough people, a lot of people wearing many hats. There's going to be very dedicated, long-time volunteers and just personalities that are sort of always around within the theater characterized in in the world as theater people and maybe in some cases that is a compliment uh, depending on who's saying it some might say that derisively i don't know what does the play say about theater people um i'm not sure that it really speaks towards theater people i think it has things to say about the theater okay right um i think uh, you know as actors or as theater artists uh, we, you know, we're, we're, we're living truthfully under imaginary circumstances, yeah. right? And what is the magic of theater? You know, we have a real situation that we're, uh, we're living in the reality, but we're also, as actors and theater artists, we're living in that unreal world. It's a rehearsed performance. It is something that we're doing on a stage. And in that gap um, is where the magic is, right? So how, how do you define that? How do you reach that to its maximum potential to create as much magic as you can within that space? And for me, uh, this play is about that. I want to maybe rephrase my question a little bit and, and think of it in terms of this. Since this is a production about a production, a, a, a mm -hmm. theater about theater, do you think this is a play that is meant for people that are very engaged in theater? Or would someone who is a more casual audience member you know, recognize, understand even things that are a little more insider that might be within it. Absolutely. I think it is for everyone. I think that if you do have the background in theater, mm -hmm. then there will be certain jokes that land really hard for you within the writing. Mm -hmm. However, if you have ever been up for a job interview, if you have ever gone on a first date, if you've ever wanted something and someone else has had the power to say no to you, then I think you can relate greatly to this mm -hmm. piece. That gets into a, a big piece of uh, what I understand the story is about, which is the audition process. Yes. What makes that different from a job interview, from a first date? Or do you think it's all the same thing? Not a lot. I think they're pretty similar, actually. Um, I mean, there are formalities. You know, you have to maybe uh, have a monologue that you perform or something. But think about when you go in for a job interview and you've got your talking points, right? Yeah. You've been at home rehearsing what you're going to say. Um, you're still on the spot. You're asked sometimes to pivot right away with an answer being thrown at you, a question being thrown at you you weren't expecting. So Same It's anxiety-inducing. Yeah. yeah, anything anxiety-inducing. <laughs> has has it uh, this production at all led you to think about the audition process itself any differently? Differently? I don't know. I mean, we, we do work a little bit differently than the... Um, mm the structure, the power structure within this play of the, the artistic directors and the directors um, that are portrayed in this story. We try to be a little bit more of a collective um, and less of that sort of hierarchical sort of power dynamic. Um, so, you know, I, if anything, I think for me, it just makes me once again, take a step back and realize how nerve wracking that can be for someone. And you want to just be kind when you ask anyone to come in and be on the spot like that. And maybe it reinforces for you that, oh, I'm glad we do it the way we do it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tamari Cooper is one of the actors in Catastrophic Theater's latest production called It Is Magic, directed by Jeff Miller. The production's on stage starting tonight, continues through March 2nd. Tamari, Jeff, thank you both very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that will do it for today's show. The Houston Matters team includes Michael Haggerty, Joshua Zinn, Troy Schultz, Celeste Sherman, Garrett Bowman, and Brenda Valdivia. Jared Carroll's our technical director. On Monday's show, ahead of next month's primary election, we'll talk with Harris County District Attorney Kim Ogg. She's facing a re-election primary challenge from a former prosecutor in her office, Sean Teer, who we are arranging to talk with soon as well. Also Monday, we'll preview a series on gospel from PBS, plus your gardening questions from Meg Tapp from the Garden Club of Houston. You can send those to talk at houstonmatters.org. And we'll recap Sunday's Super Bowl with Houston Press writer and Believe in Astros podcast co-host Jeff Balky. I'm Craig Cohen. Have a great weekend. Then join us Monday for those and other Houston Matters.